Can you, anyone hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you a little bit. We'll okay. lock it in. We'll just start and then turn it up until you get a normal right. voice. All right. All right. Okay. Are we, are we starting drops, or are we doing a test still? <laughs> are, we, are we testing? No. no. We're Go. Going. We're going. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, I'm Peter Edwards. I'm Fred Owsley. Um, I wanted to say uh, thank you to Jason Scott and to Fred for uh, asking me to come out here. This has been really exciting. I just learned what uh, Rick Rolling Rick Rolling is. <laughs> so uh, you know, I, I think the whole trip is really worthwhile. Um, now you can say you learned something. Yeah, yeah, I learned something here at Nauticon. Um, so we're we were asked to come here and talk to you all about circuit bending, um, and we both. Uh, come from different fields, but sort of meet in the middle here mm -hmm. um, in circuit bending. Um, I don't know. Well, My background is computer security, and I've been doing that for a couple years now. And just always had an interest in taking things apart and working electronics and trying to make music with it. Uh, trying to be a DJ in my spare time, but uh, that's not really working out. Your, your background is more of artist, isn't it? Yeah, so I went to art school, studied sculpture, uh, materials working. Uh, building functional objects, um, which we're going to talk a lot more about this or a fair amount more about, but I think that's one of the really exciting parts about this medium, which we're going to define and talk about, is that you can come at it from so many different directions um, and all sort of meet in this one happy uh, common ground. Right. So um, why don't you read? We've so got an we initial definition initial here. definition here. <clears throat> Just sort of talking about, you know, what is it? What we're trying to nail down what circuit bending is. And it's a lot of things, but more than anything, it's, you know, it's experimentation. And it started out with short circuiting, and it can go from that to anywhere. It's amazing the, the limitless amounts of noise you can make out of toys and other things. Um, well, I'm just going to, if we could go back just sure. for one second. Um, and one of the things that, I mean, basically what the initial... Uh, more like sort of purist definition of circuit bending, um, which is, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's sort of forming the definition of what this medium is. But um, I think the initial definition that kind of sparked the interest was that it's sort of uh, exploiting malfunction. So you're using circuitry, uh, often digital circuitry that has banks of sounds or complex uh, signal routing systems, uh, complex synthesis systems that are being confused. So uh, you know, it's, it's being made to do things it's not supposed to do, but instead of stopping, you know, instead of just breaking or not working, it plugs along anyway and it starts doing some really weird stuff. So the novelty is sort of the, uh, the on-ramp for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, as we showed here, the art of selectively short-circuiting, uncovering bizarre new modes of functionality. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to do it, um, and a lot of us have different reasons, but here I think are some sort of highlights. Um, one thing to speak to for the accessibility is that a lot of these things were just you know simple toys. Like I got this Play School keyboard, which I'll play in a second, at you know, a thrift shop for I think three dollars. And it was one of the first things that I pulled apart and started uh, bending and putting you know knobs and switches and all kinds of other touch points on it. And it's, you know it's one of the appeals is that it is so accessible, and these things are you know quite easy to find if you just go look for them. Um, yeah, because you're using. Uh, basically like obsolete uh, materials and a lot of times. you know and we're in an area an era where uh, you know planned obsolescence is such a like powerful like marketing model that there's uh, there's just an abundance of free material to use um, so I feel like it's a really good time to be involved in a medium like this where you're taking all the garbage from the world and you're actually able to do something creative with it um, and another, I think there's a real like sort of punk DIY uh, sort of feel uh, within the culture of circuit vendors. And I think a lot of that is due to it's a, the act of circuit bending is a very creative process in a lot of ways. Um, you're experimenting in the same way that you might experiment with other creative mediums of paint or play or uh, what, how else do people make stuff, plastic. Um, so it's, it's a creative process of exploration, but you're dealing with very complex uh, electronics. Um, so that's something I've done with a lot of people. Um, I did a class for a while called Creative Electronics, and we did a lot of circuit bending. It was an electronics class, but you started out with circuit bending. So it was at a real like liberal uh, school, um, not, not a very like, technically minded environment. 
and people were interested in playing with electronics, but it's a very daunting medium. So this is a way to sort of start getting involved before you really understand the intense complexities and confusion uh, of electronics. electronics. So. Um, so, yeah, to put a face on what we've been talking about, here's a couple pieces. Um, these are just to show you sort of a range. So, you know, uh, in the top corner, like, there's something you would recognize as a very musical thing. You've got a guitar pedal. That was easy. <laughs> and then this is something that Fred's been working on. Um, so we have a normal easy button that's, you know. That was easy. Yeah, then we have the easy button that has just been add an optoelectronic eye in it so you can hit it and Get some light to it. Maybe. Uh, do you need another one? It requires light. No, where's the other one? <laughs> Here, I can take Not so it's easy. It's to work. <laughs> All right, back into the box. This. So this is a. That was easy. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so that's a real like basic uh, clock speed adjustment, and we'll talk more about some of the specific adjustments that you can do, especially in the workshop. Um, here's another uh, piece which I showed briefly before, but I'll go over it again. Um, and this is that's up all the way. I don't know if I can get any more volume here. So. This is taking something, uh, you know, I don't want to go on too long about this, but this is taking a real complex speech synthesizer and you know, it to do some really interesting things, like... Uh, and while I was testing this in my hotel room before this lecture, it did something really crazy that I had to... Uh, record, because these aren't always predictable, so I didn't know if I'd be able to get it to do it again. Uh, so this was this thing, and I just threw a couple switches and it started doing this for some reason. It'll go again. And what's really interesting about that is I've been working on speaking spells and maths pretty heavily for a couple years, for eight years, and I've never heard it do that. Um, <laughs> So it's a medium that, you know, you can, it has something really valuable, I think, creatively, that it doesn't do the same thing all the time, so it shows you something new, because if it always did that, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But it has some amount of controllability, some amount of predictability, because if it was completely <laughs> random all the time, then it wouldn't really be useful as a musical tool, I think, in my opinion. Um, so I think this is like a really nice, uh, you know, middle ground. Um, so, and then we've got, there's also more uh, traditional, like, musical keyboards and drum machines. Those are great to work with, and they can be tweaked in different ways. Yeah. Um, so, some of the basics. Um, do you want to... Yeah. Uh, first thing, start with a battery-powered device. A uh, couple reasons for this. Uh, one is that you 120 can kill you. <laughs> yes. Uh, plugging into the wall, not always the best idea. Also, battery-powered devices, you're less likely to completely fry any components inside if you have a battery-powered device. Uh, you can always put in um, batteries of lesser power, some that might be a little bit dead, uh, or put a box or the resistor in, in between so you can dial down the power and make your own sort of variable power supply, which you can hook into any toy and give it you know, a lot less juice than it should be. And even that can be used in bins. Like, this is a Musini. I don't know if any of you know what this is. It's a child's toy that the kid dances around and it makes noise for the kid. Um, but it has an, I put in it a. Oops, you just fast forwarded. Oops, sorry. So a, re a rheostat here, which I've dialed the power down. And usually it's, what, six volts. And so it's probably running on three and a half right now. 
So that's normal. Kids dancing around, it's making noise. We'll play more with that later. <laughs> um, so the next, uh, so yeah, uh, basically, yeah, you're you're less likely to hurt yourself and the device if you stick with battery powered. And by the time by the time you know uh, why that's actually dangerous, you'll probably know how to avoid it if you, because there are ways to work with things that plug in. But at first, you definitely want to uh, stay away from that. So okay, the next thing is you choose inexpensive devices, and that's because you're going to break lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff. Um, except if you're incredibly intelligent and careful, like Fred here. No, I've Ooh. trashed drum machines. I okay. have a couple on I've, the floor. I've got a mountain <laughs> of broken stuff, just tons yeah. and tons. Um, That's part of the learning process, though. You know, and you part of what this. makes it so incredibly uh, rewarding when something is, you know, a successful bend. Um, but again, it's if if it, it it's a it's creative. The process itself is at its core, it's a creative process, and it's. Uh, you know, you don't always know exactly what you're doing. You don't always know exactly what you're going to come up with. And that's part of the sort of beauty of the medium. And with that comes along some of this unpredictabil <coughs> unpredictability of whether or not you're going to break it. Um, and there are ways to avoid that over time after you learn what you're doing. But um, one of those ways to avoid that is you avoid large capacitors uh, and power supplies. Because when you're poking around, if you can learn how to identify those things, you're less likely to send a very powerful signal through very delicate components. Um, in some cases, that can do really cool stuff, though. It's every device is engineered differently, uses different technology, um, so which is part of choosing inexpensive, inexpensive devices so that you can get lots of devices. You want lots of stuff to play with. And this is something I see a lot of people run into that's a problem, is that they want to get two pieces, and they want to buy you know, one switch and one potentiometer and have everything work perfectly, and that's, your, you know, that's too controlled to really come up with, I think, in my opinion, some of the really exciting results that can come from this process. Yeah. Um, so, and then there are some other ways that you can uh, refine the bends and things, general things to look for, if you want to take it from there. Yeah. Um, large ICs and pairs of ROMs. Uh, a lot of the drum machines I've been working with, they do have two ICs, you know, integrated chips, integrated circuits, that hold all the samples for that drum machine. And usually they're of a certain maker or of a certain model of um, EEPROM, and if you can find that maker model, uh, one of them is the Alesis uh, HR16 drum machine, which I've re recently trashed one of them. Um, but you pull the chips out and you can read that on a chip reader, an EEPROM reader, into the computer, and you can, I've bought chips where you can reprogram these EEPROMs and put new samples into the drum machine that you can then bend. <coughs> so researching the chips that are in certain things, if you can remove them, if they're socketed, or just desoldering them, and uh, putting new samples onto different chips and researching how it stores, you know, how a certain EEPROM store data is a good way to get new sounds out of things that you might not you know, want to experiment Which I with. think is a fairly uh, advanced uh, process of reprogramming True. ROMs, yeah. um, which I haven't gotten to. But um, <laughs> I do a lot of trying to identify what different ICs are, because there might be one that is the synthesis chip. And if I can identify, like, that's where all the you know, that's the brain of it, and that's where it's saying play these oscillators through this filter for this long, cross-modulate it with this, whatever. And you start crossing that with like AD converters or other types of data transmitters, it ends up doing lots of really kooky stuff. Or you find, you know, you might find an audio amplifier, and then you can use that, you find the input to your audio amplifier, and you can start poking that around the board and find different kinds of signals that exist in the board. So it's a very, like, kind of non-exact science, but it can also get to be very exact. Um, but regardless of what approach you're taking, you need to have a clean workspace. This is something that I push with anyone. Um, and that doesn't need to be pushed with a lot of like engineers, maybe, or people that uh, understand electronics and, and work with these really delicate processes. But a lot of the artists that are going into this medium are used to having these really messy spaces um, where you don't need to have a very clear space, but you're really fighting against yourself if you don't. So I just thought it was worth mentioning that as well as sort of a core rule. Um, and along with that goes, of course, organizing your materials, yeah. which we're going to talk about now, materials and tools. Um, 
so yeah, we thought it'd be good to mention just sort of to to uh, bring this into the real world, like how you actually do this, you know, what tools are necessary. And again, a lot of people really want to use the bare minimum. Um, and I've found that I can't go without having all of these tools in my workspace. Um, and you know, there are definitely like good quality tools, bad quality tools. Sometimes you don't need the best quality. Um, it's all what's appropriate to to your process, but. Um, you might sort of ask why there's a hand drill and hand files at the top. And a lot of the work put into these requires molding and modifying plastic. So it's, you can get great bends and get you know, cool things, but if you can't get it back together and make it functional, or if it's too delicate, you know, it's good to make it so that you know, it'll stand up for a while and not you know, break unexpectedly. Yeah, no, I'm glad you said that, because that's a, a big part of bending when I talk to other people, and I see this a lot in the different workshops I've done where people will make something do something cool, but, and then they're like, great, it does this cool thing, but then what? Like, how do you actually house that thing? How do you actually make it so that the controls are accessible? Um, you know, I always say that, like, the interface itself has an enormous impact on the type of sounds you make, the way that you interact with it, uh, the type of audio output that comes from this device. So, you know, there's, the ratio is like, you know, 50 to 70 percent of the whole process of circumventing is actually working with plastics and working with metals and wood, you know, but like it's, it's not even as much electronics as it is just physical, sculptural, or, you know, mechanical working. Um, so that's why there's lots of hand tools. Um, we've shown two soldering irons here. That's, of course, uh, one of the most valuable tools in your circumventing studio. Um, on the left, we have the more typical sort of Radio Shack 15 watt, 40 watt siding iron. And on the right is a happens to be a Weller ESD safe, you know, pretty nice soldering station. And as Fred said earlier, the one on the left is basically a wood burner. Yeah, um, and that's about all. It's <laughs> and the one on the right is a soldering iron. Yes. Um, so I always encourage people who are getting started um, to put just if you think you're going to spend more than a day a week doing this, get a good iron. It's 120 bucks or so. And it makes your life so much easier. I would, that's one of the best purchases I've made in years, was getting the, the Weller iron. It's fabulous. Um, and it stays clean. It's precise. The Radio Shack ones. I used to keep all of my old Radio Shack irons. I had about you know, 40 of them, just like a big bundle, because they break in a few months. They're total shit. So, um, so yeah, we thought it was worth mentioning that. Um, <coughs> So, you know, yeah, so then you need, of course, materials. Um, and it's really important, in my opinion, to have a variety of materials. Because, um, you know, again, this is an ex explorative, explorative, explorative exploratory <laughs> process. <clears throat> and you don't know what you're going to come up with. So you might come up with something that requires a 100K potentiometer, and all you have is like one 1K potentiometer that you bought at Radio Shack. And in order to allow yourself to really explore, you need to have a variety. Um, I'll let you go yeah. for it, because I've been talking a lot. We have uh, just some photos you grabbed off the web. Switches, anything, toggle switches, micro switches, all kinds of things you can uh, buy, repurpose. You have some old electronics. You find some stuff that might be broken. Um, I've bought things just for switches, <laughs> like swap baits. Yeah. Oh, that's a cool light. I could use that. Uh, potentiometers, I have. Um, I bought just old potentiometers, you know, big resistors, rheostats, you know, whatever you can use in something. And a breadboard, uh, which is on the left, very basic tool for prototype electronics. And also can be used in circuit bending, which I'll show you at the end. I have a breadboard uh, hooked up to a DB25 port. And this is modular, can be plugged into anything that I wire a DB25 port into. Plug it in and just start bending by, by moving the wires around and crossing different pins here. But right, so he has the okay. breadboard wired to this jack, each yeah. pin to another row in the breadboard. So I'll show that off at the end. Um, and just for anybody who's not familiar, we just have some pictures of capacitors on the top, resistors on the bottom, there's common electrical components. Um, I've been able to get by doing a lot of circuit bending without for, for several years without, ever, without actually having any of these components. Um, but it's very useful to have some around and start experimenting yeah. uh, with adding them into the circuits. Transistors should be up there as well, but uh, they're not. Um, so where do we get the tools? There's a lot of different places to get this stuff. Yeah. 
Um, there's always the wrong places to get this stuff, though. You usually don't need to go to um, like specialty stores, I think. Like Radio Shack is last resort for everything ever. Um, I, yeah, they're awful. Tag, swale, <laughs> tag sales and swap meets are great places to get tools. Um, as long as they're not you know, worn out, as long as they're sharp or you can sharpen them, uh, you can get some you know, really great tools at you know, really decent prices. You're not paying full price for a brand new tool, which you know that you, know, you might beat up or you know, break. So she uh, files in it's you know files that are still sharp, hand files, that type of thing, hand drills, drill bits. Um, and this would be a topic for another talk, but um, you know my my slogan has always been anything you could ever want is being thrown out somewhere. So m a lot of the stuff I've gotten is from the trash. Um, I also lived in a college town for a while, and at the end of every year they would get rid of lots of stuff, like lots and lots and lots of stuff, and I would just load up on you know electronics and you know, printers and printer ink and uh, tools and just all kinds of stuff. Um, so I've gotten a lot of stuff from uh, thrift stores, tag sales, uh, like boxes on the side of the road that say free. Um, I got a Commodore 64 that way. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, on the it's, it's, what is it, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Um, and that's where, you know, again, you're kind of playing this idea of using obsolete objects. So, and that can be tools sometimes, quality tools too. Um, So, the big question. Yeah, the big what question. What should I bend? Um, we came up with last night, simple but not too simple. You know, the easy button is relatively simple. You only really, you know, one function. It plays a recorded voice. But you know, you're still able to bend it and get some different, you know, types of noises out of it. But it's not, it's not inherently complex like the speak and math. As you can get, I don't know, a ton of different types of sounds out of it. Um, and if you go too complex, you can get... Uh, things that just don't bend in a way that enhances its functionality at all in any way, or it'll be like a really complex keyboard or a big home organ or something, um, although those can be fun to work on. But, um, or you'll break something really valuable, um, or there'll just be too much going on. Like it's good to have something where you can see like there's the synthesis chip, that's where all the sound's coming from. But when you've got like a whole complex system of like it might be coming out of one area, but then it has to be multiplexed with something over here, and then it needs to be amplified and then mixed, and then it's going through all this different stuff. It can be really hard to isolate the real like meat of the piece. Yeah. Um, one of the first things I started out with was this Play School keyboard. Like I said, I got it at a Goodwill. It was like three bucks, and fairly simple as far as you know the boards inside and the patches that were made. The soldering points are big, though the chips are big. There's not really anything discrete and really tiny, hard to solder onto. So it's a great thing to start on. Um, one of the other things that I picked up kind of recently was a this is a great Roland piece. 707, predecessor to the 808 and the 909. Um, you know, vintage drum machine. And again, it doesn't look bent at all. Maybe this knob, but you know, I just lost the knob. But here's the port that I was talking about, which you can patch on this uh, breadboard like that. So there you have, this is wired inside to the two sample chips. And you can just sort of patch bins in between the two chips. And what does it sound like, Fred? Great question. So you're able to do a lot of different effects ranging from kind of subtle to pretty extreme and you, you can isolate different sounds. Uh, some bends will affect everything, some will affect just the bass drum. Um, 
you know, again, you just sort of experiment and see what you come up with. Um, this is something I worked on when I was just starting and I broke a whole bunch of them. And they're kind of expensive and I could have waited. Um, but, and this is a piece that's like great on its own too. It has individual outputs for all the drums, MIDI control, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, but this falls pretty well on the range of like, you know, <coughs> simple but not too simple, but also complex but not too complex. It's like a nice middle range piece. Um, and they sell for about 100 and change. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, and then I say again, cheap toys, because you're going to break a lot of stuff. Um, you know, drum and keyboard toys like that, the Furbies, anything that has a speech synthesizer. And you'll recognize the difference between a speech synthesizer and a sample is, uh, you know, a sample playback will have, like, there's a person in a room with a mic who's recording samples, and a speech synthesizer, uh, it sounds more robot -y. I don't know how to really explain it. Um, you know, the Furbies are all speech synthesis. Um, they're incredibly complex, advanced little robot toys. Here's another crazy... It's actually a voice changer. It's a kit from Velleman. And it's not exactly circuit bent, but it's in a creative casing, at least. <laughs> Let me see if I can turn it down. It has lights. Makes you crazy when you wear it too. So. Oh, um, apparently. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um. Oh, Where are we? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, uh, anything that modulates sound, uh, guitar pedals, speech synthesizers, uh, can be glitched out in interesting ways. Yeah. Uh, simple video games. I got one of the. Um, Atari retro consoles that you can get now. Not the one that's just in the joystick, the actual console that has, you know, Yard's Revenge and all those other amazing games in it. And I broke it open and started, you know, hooked up the TV and started, you know, bending it and it got all these great video and like Atari noises coming out of it. And it was kind of cool. It's not done yet, so I didn't bring it, but another another good thing. Yeah, so it's not exclusively sound. Um, you know, I've seen people work with video editors, and get some interesting results. And again, it's all just this process of just poking around and seeing what happens. Um, but then once you find something, then it takes, you know, at first it's very experimentational, and then when you find stuff, then it takes a level of, you know, expertise or, uh, you know, precision to, to allow you access to those, uh, those effects and those parameters. But initially, it requires just a very, uh, you know, creative explorer, exploration process. Yeah. What's the word? Exploitative? Uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, there's lots of places to find stuff. The uh, toy stores are last resort, always. Um, sometimes you can get stuff on, like, super discount if you really need to get, like, a bunch of them and they're on clearance or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, clearance, tag sales, yard sales, thrift stores, that's where I've gotten most stuff. And then eBay if you need something specific, but you're always going to pay more. Yeah. Um, and you'll start to see different trends if you're like in the market for stuff. So it's like, I needed a bunch of these. I just bought 50 of these for a big project. So the only way to do that was just to go on eBay. I couldn't just search around thrift stores. And you pay a premium. Like, I can get this at a thrift store for a dollar or eBay for 20 and then like 25 with shipping. But I can't, you know, I needed them and uh, that's the only way to get stuff. What's that? It must have had quite an effect on the market. For a few days, yeah, or a week or two. Yeah, I control the, the, the eBay Speaking uh, sales. threatening people. When I'm off. Um, so, yeah, I want to do that. That's what you guys are supposed to be saying at this point. Yeah. 
Um, so, well, we'll go over some links. I'm just going to go over my site a little bit and show you. Uh, I have some tutorials on here. So I'm just going to show you a couple things real quickly. Um, you can even play some of the stuff if you want. OK. So this is Casper Electronics. This is my website um, that I've been documenting stuff on for a couple years. Um, and what I've been trying to do lately is include schematics and tutorials. Um, I also have a blog on the front. Here's the new Speak and Spell project I'm working on. Uh, and so there's some other things. Uh, this is, i just show this really quickly. Um, this is a guitar joystick module. And this is part of what I was saying about how the means by which you access the effects will, affect, you know, will have a huge impact on the types of sounds you make. So he's got two controls on here for affecting the rate of the decay. One is a knob and one's a joystick. And is that a standard guitar? That's a regular old guitar that we oh. drilled out and built this circuit into. Um, we're sorry the video is no longer available. Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Uh, At least you didn't get Rickrolled. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't. The page. Yeah. I always worry that YouTube's gonna crash and lose all this valuable info. Um, I think. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so he's just affecting basically the playback of the sample that's been recorded. Um, and, you know, so you can hear you're getting types of sounds that you wouldn't get from something that, I'll just play again real quick, that you wouldn't get if he was affecting, you know, just turning it with a knife. So that's a very, like, sequence type of sound. Um, so, you know, I wanted to show you this. So, like, here's a few different, like, type groups of schematics. Um, so you can see a little bit more of the process. So here's one. This is, I've been working with a guy in the UK who does really phenomenal work. Um, he's an electrical engineer who's gotten into circuit bending. Um, so he's been sending me some info, and I've been sort of trying to process it in a way that uh, can be taken in by, like, the average dude. Um, so, you know, I like to simplify it all down to one picture. So, you know, here's the circuit. That's what you got to do with it. You can just print it out, put it on your workbench. You don't need to, if I have to read three pages of text, I'm not going to read it. I, I, you know, I think a lot of people are like that, maybe. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I'm one of the billion people with ADD, and, uh, you know, I like it to be nice, easily uh, digestible pieces. So, you know, here's showing you're going to be connecting to, you know, these three points on the circuit, connected to a switch. Um, and, you know, this is just supposed to give you an idea of, like, the actual physical process. Um, and that it is relatively simple. You're just connecting wires to a potentiometer, soldering them to the board. Um, and, you know, here are some of the sounds. And this is a lot more text if one wants to read about it. They can. Um, so... Um, I don't know what effect that is. Um, so these are just examples of like what all those bends do. Um, I don't, I don't know why the labels are coming up here that would explain what they are. But this is an SA keyboard, which is a really great example of what circuit bending, uh, a sort of classic circuit bending effect. Um, so let me see if I can find the other. Okay, the SA2. And this is sort of uh, really simply sums up what circuit bending does. So this is a keyboard, regular old keyboard, and you press a button and suddenly it does this. Completely self-generated, and yeah, so here's another one. One more. Um, 
and it, these are, you know, again, completely self-generated sequences. Um, you know, I'm not sure exactly why they do that, but they do. Um, this is a really popular piece. This is the uh, Barbie karaoke machine, which um, <laughs> does a lot of really... Click on that picture. Make that full. Fantastic yeah, do, stuff. Do it one more time. Just make it real big. There you go. Um, I think, wait, let me see if I can zoom in even closer. Yeah. So, yeah, there's the, the Barbie. No, those are just potentiometers, old potentiometers. Um, Isn't that on the side? What's on the... Uh, this one? Oh, that's, no, that's just another potentiometer. Oh. Um, but this has a bunch of different uh, functions. Uh, you know, it plays tapes, it has inputs, um, and it has an echo, this little echo feature, which is really the, the magic in this thing. Barbie so. is a great mall. She's talking about Barbie. Specific. Okay, so here's one like there's a tape playing. So that's a tape playing, adjusting the speed, feeding it into the echo, changing the pitch of the echo. Um, it does a bunch of other stuff. Did you make that yourself? Yeah, I should. Where did you get all those knobs and buttons and dials? They're all very relevant sound samples. Um, and it does stuff like this. Uh, I'm kind of going on a bit. Um, so here's uh, Barbie bending. Um, and this is where I talk a little bit about it. I show, you know, here's how to... Uh, well, again, it's kind of a small picture here. Here's how to take out the... Uh, pitch control. It's like a voltage regulator in the motor, and then you can put in your own voltage regulator, change the speed of the motor. There's other ways to do this. This is a fairly quick and dirty way that works. Um, and then, you know, in keeping with the, uh, the sort of all-in-one page approach, you know, here's sort of the master schematic for the Barbie. Um, <coughs> Showing how you can access, there's like a pin that connects to an auxiliary board, or sorry, a row of pins with a ribbon uh, connector, and you can actually connect, disconnect that, and if you want to rehouse this whole thing, you can do that and access all the pins there. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, here's another one that's showing how to modify, how to modify the echo. Um, and the last part I'll show you um, well, I'll show you this too. This is a double Barbie. This is two Barbies built into one housing. And, you know, this is a real kind of noisy monster. Um, which, let's see if I can get it to play. So this is a completely self-generated sound. Um, very quiet sound, but... So some of this stuff is a little more musical than other things. Um, this is not musical by traditional standards, but uh, I like it. So, um, and then I also put up a speak and spell bending thing. Um, and I actually have something here. Um, so here are just some different schematics. And again, you're just going into the speak and spell. Here's the circuit board. Um, and you're just connecting points together with pieces of wire that you connect to switches. This is showing how to make a relay sequencer to turn bits on and off, which is what I have in this piece here, which you can see later, where the sequencer runs. You can see it running here. I don't, I think you can see that. Um, and it runs across and it activates different sounds. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but I'll, I'll show people examples of this later, or how that works. Um, and then another example up here of an LFO. So you can modulate the pitch of the speak and spell. And I used, again, the same image here of how you wire in your simple pitch modulating circuit. Um, and I have here, I just did this recently. Uh, I took this image. This is sort of like my master schematic. Um, and had this printed a whole bunch of times for this uh, paper in New York 
Uh, I have them here, which I'll give out to interested parties. I'm not selling them. Um, but this is like a show paper for shows in Brooklyn, and it's outdated, so you can't go to any of the shows, but uh, you can hang this colorful poster on your wall and enjoy it every day. Um, I've already found some errors on it, um, so you might not want to try to bend from it, but uh, you know, it's supposed to just be an inspiring image. And I, this is sort of, I enjoyed doing these drawings. Um, so it was a fun thing to do. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I just wanted to show a couple examples of, you know, the guts of these things. Um, you know, I think we wanted to sort of introduce to people who weren't familiar with this process what it is, talk a little bit about, you know, what you're actually going to need if you want to get into it, um, and then show a little bit more detail of, uh, you know what what what's going to be what's going to happen when you cut these things open um, what kind of guts are going to spill out um, and then we're going to follow up with a workshop at seven in the main room up front so if you really want to actually get your hands dirty um, we're going to be there showing uh, these pieces working on other people's pieces if they bring them in uh, sharing uh, vast amounts of knowledge and wisdom yes <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I think that, oh, so we have a couple links. There's lots and lots of info available <laughs> online. Um, you know, it was really hard to like decide like, well, what links do we put, you know, other than our own, of course. Yeah. Um, so there's Fred Owsley's page, mine's Casper Electronics on the left. Um, but you know, again, there's so many people out there doing really fantastic work. Um, and so I think if you just type in circuit bending, you're going to find a lot of stuff. You go to Get Lo-Fi, that's a blog um, where he talks about, uh, you know, different people that are selling stuff. Or he'll, like, just list, like, hey, somebody's selling, you know, eight speaking spells on eBay. You know, why don't you go get them? Um, the Bent Festival is coming up uh, in New York, and there's one in L.A., and there's one other one somewhere else. Um, that's April, I think, like, 25th. Um, that's a really exciting festival. There's lots of people. People come from all over the world um, and show off their stuff, play music. There's a lot of workshops. Um, so all the info you need is there. Uh, of course, Make Magazine um, is There's an inspiration to many. Circuit bending and all kinds of other stuff. Right. Yeah, there was an issue where they went over circuit bending. Um, but that's like the general ethos that this all fits into is like, uh, you know, getting at everyday objects and, and ripping into them. And, bending them to your will. Uh, and that's really, I think, something that they embrace. Um, and I don't know who Lady Ada is. Yeah, a friend of mine who does all kinds of um, electronics building and has made all kinds of cool things. So. Um, and that's, again, sort of, I think she, I, I remember looking at it, it sort of illustrates some of the ways that this medium spreads out. It has, like, many arms that, you know, reach into lots of other pies and <laughs> dabble and touch them uh, provocatively. Um, so, you know, it's not all just about taking toys and modifying them. It's really about, uh, you know, beginning this sort of, uh, the growth of this little creature in your brain that wants you to take lots of cheap electronics and open them up and start seeing what can be pulled out of them. Um, Do we have any time? Do we have like five or ten minutes to just make some noise? Yeah? All right. Cool. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's, I think, a few things Watch up here that... Uh, we haven't had a chance to show, and then uh, we're. If you want that? I'll take the. We'll the be happy to right take some channel, questions. And you can just have the left channel. Um, Is anything that you're going to demonstrate uh, for sale today? Yes, actually. <coughs> I'm glad you asked. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, this piece right here, uh, the stylish MT4, is uh, currently for sale. That's fantastic. Uh, well, thank you. And how much would a person pay for something this like This piece that? is three hundred dollars. Um, so, and I've got uh, some other pieces on my site um, and some new models that I'm working on and echo pedals and some other things, which you can see if you go to my site. I have a, I've just added a for sale page. So, um, so here are some examples of what this can do along with the circuit bent drill machine. Um, yeah, it's not making any noise. Is this DI? Oh, I think it's going to mono. Mm, will that even work? Is, are we up? Yeah. Maybe the white cable instead of the red one? 
Oh, yeah, it's the white instead of the red. And here we are, mono. Okay. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, maybe you can make some noise. Um, Try again. Okay, so there is very quietly. So I actually did do a quick sample of this, but uh, just very briefly. Oh, and it does this thing a lot. Is there any way to turn this on? Yeah. Uh, which I don't know why this does this, but uh, you can see it's backwards, would you do? Um, yeah, tool, ooh, okay, but trust me, it says would you do. And um, I've spent a long time trying to figure out what that is, why that happens. Um, I think it's, it's saying something that my mind isn't uh, really, ex you know, I haven't exercised enough to really take it in. Uh, it would probably have damaging uh, repercussions if I was to try to really understand it. Um, but, uh, so there's a few basic features that, um, you know, I mean, I'll talk to people individually if they want, I mean, gladly. I, it's hard to shut me up once I start talking about this stuff. Um, but I can go over the features that it has. But uh, one of my favorite things that these do is this really bizarre looping feature. It does that. I don't know why it does, you know, like it's And then you can adjust the pitch. But then you can get it to do a loop randomized. So it's doing a loop, but then, let me start that over. So it's doing a loop, but then you can make it introduce little bits of random noise into that loop for some reason. So there's lots of like subtle little adjustments that you can do. And then you throw on this other switch and it starts getting crazy. Um, and then it'll just go. Like, I can set it down and, and let it do its thing. So something that I enjoy doing musically is I'll get a few things like this going, and then I just sort of let it go. And once in a while, I'll step forward and This goes. Um, so it's more like I feel like it's like a, I'm in a big room with like a bunch of those big exercise balls or something, and I just kind of like push one and then push another, and they all kind of start dancing together. Um, and then once in a while, I need to get it rolling again. Um, so, so there's that thing. Um, and if Fred, if you want to show, uh, I think we're actually kind of almost out of time. Almost out of time. But, um, But yeah, real quickly, and then we'll be happy to answer questions. So I'm not terribly sure what, if I remember correctly, what all these things do. But we have your normal keyboard function, and it can play a melody. pitch bends. And I also added some touch points on two chips that I found by just sort of actually placing my fingers around the board, uh, the circuit board, and trying to find some other stuff. So we have a lower one. Yeah. <laughs> so you can play some happy birthday, but it's you don't have to pay the royalty rates for that. They're just sort of glitch switches, just making random loops. There's a, uh, a sort of a little drum machine rhythm section in here. There's the drum machine.
and very simple, but. This even has a, a playback and a, a sort of memory function to playback sounds for you. So everything I just played. Any questions? Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Uh, yeah. Yes, of course. <coughs> How could you not be turned on by this? Yeah. That's. Um, yeah, Fred, why don't you Cheap ploy to get you in the room, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, we just... Got me late, I don't know. We really want to be liked <laughs> and be popular, so... All right. Anybody else? Okay. Any real questions? Any questions? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm just kidding, sorry. Does this work in like a live environment? Because you seem to lack any sort of predictability, and it seems like between songs you would yeah. have, you know, 30 minutes of Higher, higher. Well, I think the goal in, I mean, a lot of the things we were talking about, like having a good workspace, having good tools, is so that you don't ever have to fix things. I mean, like, they can be built very, very well, so they do not break. So that's whatever. That's uh, an issue of craftsmanship. But as far as how, the, are, are these musical? Could they be used in traditional musical settings? Um, I think. Uh, you know, I'm involved with the Bent Festival, and I was asked to help get circuit bending bands. And I don't really know a lot of circuit bending circuit bending bands that are fun to listen to. A lot of it's just noise, <laughs> and that's a really tough part of the medium. Is that uh, you know, there's sort of this weird thing with uh, eight bit music and circuit bending seem to be like in the same ring together, but eight bit always like consumes it because it's an interesting medium. It has a lot of the same appeal in a similar way, but it's actually fun to listen to. Um, this stuff I've found, I've sold to a lot of different clients, different kinds of clients, a lot of rock musicians, um, a lot of, so it's basically like rock musicians who want something like kooky to inject in between songs or like that little accent. Uh, a lot of like hip hop guys that want like something that's really like fucking fresh and crazy looking, like they just got that <laughs> crazy shit. So it's like a CD turntable with a guitar neck on it and everybody's like, holy shit, it's a CD turntable or, you know, with a guitar neck. Um, so, you know, like the real like flash stuff. Um, and then a lot of like experimental sound, soundscape. I do a lot of music with this stuff and it's, it's a relationship with you and the instrument that you don't have, I think, with other kinds of instruments where you're saying you're bringing some of yourself to the table and they're bringing some of what they do to the table and you're sort of working together. I don't want to get too, like, I don't know, weird, heady about it or something, but like you're really working with each other as opposed to just controlling an instrument, which I know that most instruments, they have like their own things they bring and physical elements and parameters that are you know, limitations that you need to work with. But this is, I think, a, a, an entirely unique kind of process of you know, embracing elements of, of unpredictability. And instead of trying to eliminate that, really kind of celebrating that and bringing that into your composition in a way that strengthens it, um, which is possible in certain types of music. Yeah. So. You have a question? Um, well, I was just going to say that, um, oh. I was just going to say that I don't think there, there are some artists who probably don't use it as an instrument itself, but to generate a sample that they would then work into something else. I mean, I've heard a lot of, well, that was new. I've heard a lot of industrial, more recent industrial, that's not actually tape loops of industry, but of broken stuff. Mm -hmm. Doing basically that. Can I try a stab at that? Uh, uh, please. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, introduce I'm yourself. Please, huh? it, would, you, would you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm, I'm George Sanger, I'm the fat man, and uh, I've worked on a lot of games uh, for 25 years, uh, but I also do real music, quote unquote. But anyway, uh, uh, the aesthetic, I think, is uh, uh, my friend Tom, I don't know if he's here, but he who built me Excalibur Rito, which is along these lines. Um, and what you do is, it's somewhere in the music, towards the camera, <laughs> the camera loves me. Uh, <laughs> If you have a spot in your music where you go, uh, something really nasty would fucking sound great here, and then you you you, know, you wire in Excaliburito, and there's a sort of threshold that once you're ready for something really like awful right there, uh, then uh, it uh, it never goes below a certain threshold of awfulness. It only rises a 
rises in greatness. So, so you learn to like roll with it. it. It's like Excaliburito can't make a sound that isn't the glorious Excaliburito sound, and I believe that, that these are probably along those lines. And uh, Jonathan Colton uses it in some of his songs, and I use it in regular songs too. Okay, and with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. And I just wanted to remind everybody, I'm, I'm here from California filming the event, and so if you want to buy some DVDs, they're $15 a piece, $10, or $10 a piece if you buy 100 or more. And uh, they're out there on the table. We basically have the entire conference. If you're watching at home, the website's www.mediaarchives.com. And I want to thank you guys again for being here. Yep. Uh, this is awesome. And I want to say thanks to Nauticon, to Block Party, uh, for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to be over in the front room at 7 to answer more questions, or you know, we'll be ever, you know, all over uh, to answer questions. But if you want to work on stuff. So thanks a lot. <laughs>